All right, hello. Uh, I this is my first uh, actual like research presentation. Thank you. Well deserved applause. I know. Um, I did another one with Jose uh, a while ago, but this is my first one. I'll be presenting about how I got uh, started with home labbing, and also how you guys can do it too. Thank you so much, Kenny. I think you have a really cool outfit today. All right, so first, this is me. Who am I? My name is Maxim Vladimir Kochnev, uh, from New York City, or Staten Island. Well, uh, it's kind of funny. I'm a second year cybersecurity major. Um, what do I like? I like jazz, food, cats, and basketball. I try and combine all four when, when I do. Uh, this is just pictures of me. It's me when I was a kid. Uh, very, a lot of drip as a child. All right. So this is the agenda for today. Uh, we're going to talk about what is home labbing, uh, why you should have a home lab. We're going to talk about the incident of 10 2023. <laughs> Setting up your home lab, uh, how to get remote access to it so you can work on it from anywhere not just when you're connected to it by uh, wire. Um, we're gonna talk about setting up virtual networks and routers so it's secure, especially when you got a public IP like at RIT or some other places. Uh, set up like a Windows VM, because it's pretty cool to have, like containers are pretty sim uh, simple, but when you go into that, it's a little more complicated. Uh, some cool ideas for you, and then some next steps. <coughs> so what is home labbing? Uh, home labbing, if you deconstruct the word, it's a self-hosted home, server, or a collection of servers where you can host applications, virtualized services, as well as machines. That's the lab part. And you make them assess accessible to you. So anything you host there, uh, you can use, which is great because uh, you can do a bunch of different stuff. And we'll see. So why should you start home labbing? Uh, it's a quick and efficient way to spin up a container and test various applications and services. So if you spin something up and you try something out and it doesn't work, that container doesn't exist anymore. You delete it and your problems are gone. Uh, it's a great learning experience. I know me personally, uh, there's no better way I learn than to try it out myself. Uh, if I read about it somewhere, I don't know, it's, I hear about it, but I can't really know how it works and like the intricacies of it until I actually do it. Um, if you don't trust, uh, hold up. okay. Uh, if you don't trust some provider to manage your data, uh, some like common example would be like, if you have a password manager like Bitwarden, uh, I know they, they have like a way that you can store all your passwords with their services, but they also have a self-hosted option where you can store it. That's something you can do on a home lab. Um, Another example would be like some kind of cloud storage. Uh, obviously, there's services where you can store all your stuff, but maybe you want to have it um, just accessible to yourself in a way you see everything, where everything is. Um, so that's, that's an example. Just make sure you know what you're doing because uh, you have to know that what you're doing, it's going to be a better alternative than if you were to outsource it to something else. Um, it's scalable. Only limit is your imagination and hardware. Um, so we'll see later, especially with the software that I'm going to be running, uh, you can easily add stuff and your home lab will grow. Uh, and you get a use for a computer, uh, old computer, never use it anymore, don't know what to do with it, turn into a home lab. Um, and you can host some really cool stuff that'll actually improve your daily life. I'll show you guys how it improves my daily life in a bit. <coughs> So you may be wondering, I want to start a home lab, but I don't know, if I just have a computer, that's not really a home lab. Well, no, it doesn't have to be some crazy super lab where you have thousands of dollars of devices and resources that uh, can calculate, I don't know, the, the whatever, everything. Yes? So that's a home lab. Um, <laughs> I think, I think, uh, I'm not sure what it does, but it's just some kind of home lab. Um, but what I'm saying is it looks all crazy. I'm sure it does all this cool stuff, but it doesn't have to be all that. It doesn't have to be all that, you know? 
Sometimes it'll just be a little, a humble little stack, of, <laughs> stack of computers next to your desk, where you got, um, you know, your cactus and your bird on top of it. Uh, just be one or two devices. You need one device. Uh, it's what you virtualize that matters, right? <laughs> the incident of 10, 20, 23. Uh, this is, is going to be a home lab core story. Uh, this is going to be a story about what you ever want to do. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about it right now. So uh, I came to, I, I had uh, my home lab started last year. Uh, when I got the free computer, one of those free computers from uh, Ops, uh, and then I spun up. I just started up my home lab here. Well, no, I didn't start it here. I started it at home because uh, I didn't have time to do it here. Started at home. Uh, you know, home. I have like this uh, private network behind your ISP. Everything's normal, right? I had my clock clock playing around with it. Decided to take it to RIT where I live. I live uh, some. I live at Farpoint, uh, and they have their their own. Uh, Wi-Fi separate to RIT. Uh, so I set it up. I have to reconfigure it because now it's a different IP address. You'll see what I use the Proxmox. It's um, you access the web GUI through uh, your IP. So if you move it and you get a new IP, uh, you can't access it because the IP is not valid. You're not going to the same place. So I set up uh, my home lab at Park Point. Uh, everything's going great. Everything's going great. Uh, as far as I know, uh, you know, I, I'm looking to see what, what what new stuff could I do. So I'm I'm like playing around with stuff. One day I'm in uh, sysadmin. I'm, I'm in sysadmin class, and I talk to Jose. Uh, I say, Oh, you know, uh, you know how to like set up pfSense because I just want all of my IPs natted. I don't want to have like people like, getting new ones, right? And he was like, Sure, I'll sit next to you. I'll show you. I'll show you how to do it. He looks at my web GUI, he, he says, is that a public IP? I go, no, it's not a public IP. It was a public IP. Um, so he goes, uh, check your syslogs. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, everyone and their mothers was just trying to get a taste of my two containers that I was hosting in my Proxmox. Um, at some point, Jose was on this list. Actually, I saw, I literally saw his name. Uh, that, that was that was pretty. I he was. I was sitting next to him. He goes, "Oh, look! These are all the services that are exposed to the internet." I was like, "Thanks, Jose. That's cool." Um, <laughs> so, so I, I I was that's that's not good, you know. So um, he was like, "Where? How long have you had this up?" About a month. Okay, um, so this, by the way, um, this is over the span of a second. This is milliseconds. People are constantly trying to get in. You can see on different ports, they're they are doing whatever they can to get into there. Um, yeah. Why was your firewall? My my firewall was uh, operating on an. Uh, there was no firewall. <laughs> there was no firewall. Rules, okay. Um, clearly, there's no firewall rules. Um, he also asked me, do you have at least uh, a good password? <laughs> <laughs> password was crap. Uh, <laughs> terrible password. Um, you know, yeah, yeah, SSH, probably everything. SSH, password list, just whoever, whoever wants it, just get in. You know what? It's all, all that cool stuff. Um, so then I, uh, the rest of that day, I was like, okay, I, I, I didn't listen to, I paid attention to anything happened in syslab, uh, sysadmin, um, not that I ever do, but um, yeah, I was just, I was just like trying to focus on that. Um, and then, and then it, the real, the real, I think the worst part, the worst part of this whole experience is I, I stepped outside and Jose said, I'm disappointed in you. <laughs> and that was, that was just. No, you know what I did? I decided I need to lock in. <laughs> I need to lock in. I said, enough is enough. You guys are not allowed to get into my computer anymore. 
the whoever was kind of getting from all over the place. Um, so while I still had that, I, I decided I was going to wipe the whole thing. Um, you know, there's, there's, I don't know who's on there, what kind of persistence they have. So once I figure out how to set up uh, PFSense on there and set up a firewall, uh, then I'll, you know, I can do it quickly when I boot up, when I boot it up again, because the second I start, they're going to just start trying to get into my computer. Um, so here's some things I, some things I learned. Um, always at least have an idea of what you're doing before you do it. Uh, home lab is meant for experimenting, but doesn't mean you can do stupid things without thinking about the consequences. Uh, I did a stupid thing. I tried to, um, I, I thought, I, I set up tail scale to, um, if, and if you don't know what that is, like, I'll, we'll talk about it uh, in a few slides, but it's, it's a VPN, peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. So I would be here, I would set up, I would go into my VPN with a public IP and uh, connect to my public IP uh, server, so there's no point of it. So I clearly didn't really understand what was happening uh, what, by what I was doing, I just thought it would work. So I think you should definitely, in the future, me personally, I'm gonna, you know, make sure I, I get a good understanding. Even if I'm experimenting, I wanna know what I'm doing. Um, it's definitely a good idea to be like constantly monitoring for things like this. Um, I set up like some kind of monitoring just to like see if there's any like anomalies every now and then. Um, and if you're going to make, and this goes back to what I said before, if you're going to self-host something important, uh, make sure you know it's it's secure the way you're doing it. Because even though you might think that oh like I'm saving money doing it myself, you gotta make sure it's you know it's secure. Everything's safe. Uh, so this is how we set up Proxmox. Um, this first slide. Uh, so a lot of you got your um, free PCs from. RIT, they were giving out a lot of them, so I know a lot of you guys have them, right? Um, but maybe you don't want to use that uh, Ubuntu thing that comes with it. So how are you going to do it? You put in the USB, try and wipe it. Problem is, the BIOS is locked. You can't, uh, you can't wipe it. You ask you for the password. Enter Jose computer wipe method. This is what you're going to do. Huh? Take the battery out. Um, okay, so you open it up, disconnect the hard drive. So it's gonna have those two little things connected to the hard drive in there. You're gonna take those two things out. Uh, you're gonna put in the flash drive with the Proxmox ISO in it, and you're gonna boot it. Uh, you can go through the install process. It's, it's a very simple process with Proxmox. Uh, it, it tells you everything. Like you'll, it'll like, it's very easy. If you don't, and if it, you don't want to like mess anything up, you can look up a, vi a YouTube video. It's like 10 minutes setup. It's easy. Um, and then, so once you're going through the install process, it's going to ask what kind of hard, what hard drive you want to boot it to. Uh, can't find it though. So you're going to reconnect the hard drive under the hood, uh, and then you're going to reboot it. And for some reason, it's going to boot to the flash drive. I don't know why. Please, someone explain it to me. Uh, I don't know enough about the computers to tell you that. <clears throat> uh, you, now you're going to go through the normal install process. Uh, like I said, it's very easy. It'll take you through it. Uh, you're going to log into the web GUI. I'll tell you about that next slide. And just make sure you change it to dark mode because you don't want to be using it on light mode. That's strange. All right. OK. So <laughs> all right. So this is the uh, web GUI. Uh, so when you, whenever you um, Oh, one second. Did I skip the slide? Yeah. Okay. So when you yeah, after you install, it's going to load you into a console, and you're going to see at the top it's going to say HTTP, um, HTTPS, and then your IP, and it's going to be running on port 8006, I believe. So you're going to put that in, and this is what you're going to see. You see this web GUI. So up here, this is the uh, the it's the entire environment, and right here is one node. So this is one of the computers that I set up. Um, so when I got that PC, I set up, and now it's this one. These are all of my instances from here. This is a container. If it's this little cube right here, that's a container. If it's this thing right here, that's a VM. Uh, right here, local, that's where you're going to store all of your ISOs and container templates. We'll talk about that in the next slide. And local LVM, that's the big storage where you're going to store all your uh, storage for your VMs, actually, like what they're, you know, 
all the actual storage. Um, down here, you got like tasks, like you'll see like um, this, my, you know, the node, the central node, up to the package database. Uh, whenever you see some stuff, it'll give you the container ID or the VM ID and can tell like what happened. So I logged into the console here. This one, I was away from the console too long. And, um, connection timed out. Um, and yeah, so if it's if it's gray out like that, that means that it's uh, currently stopped. Uh, and those green things mean that they're currently running. So uh, a container, so it's VM setup, for the most part, it's pretty easy. Uh, first, you gotta download the ISO, probably in that local that I showed you before. I know there's some other places for it, but I always just use local. Um, so for VMs, uh, you can either download, you have your ISO download from your machine and you just drop it into Proxmox, um, or you can give it a URL, so uh, clear the URL and it'll download it from there. So you don't actually have to download to the computer first. Uh, oh, let's see, same way it does. Uh, container templates, they do the same thing, um, but Proxmox also comes with a, a big uh, library of container templates, so uh, a lot of the containers I use there, I just grab them from the Proxmox thing that's already in the web GUI. Um, and now after you download the ISO, you're gonna, there's going to be a button at the top. Uh, doesn't I show it, but it says create VM or create container. Um, <clears throat> right here in the general settings, you got the node, you got the container ID, it's a host name, it's going to be the name of your virtual machine. Uh, you know, your two passwords, you load your uh, SSH public key. Um, that's what that way you don't have to do it another way. You do it right at setup. Uh, the template that's going to be the ISO image that you're going to use. Disk size, that's like the uh, hard drive that like you're going to allocate a certain amount of space uh, from your local LVM. Uh, CPU, you can allocate the number of cores and processors. Um, then memory is going to be the amount of memory. Uh, network, which I'm going to show you what interface as well as which bridge. So we're going to look at bridges in a couple slides. Uh, also tells you, ask you if you want any DHCP or statically assign those IPs. Uh, DNS, I uh, just use my host, uh, and then you finish and it creates it. Uh, so remote access, uh, what I use is Tailscale. So uh, it works by having one LXC, that's a Linux container as an exit node which advertises the network. So um, basically I have one container just allocated for that service, which is Tailscale. I have it installed there and it's an exit node. So to do that, you spin up a container, update and upgrade. Uh, you're gonna install curl so that you can download it because if you're installing for Linux, it's uh, you're gonna have to use some curl download from the Tailscale website. Uh, download Tailscale. Um, you're going to have to allow IPv forwarding in this directory. Uh, yeah, so you just uncomment. It's commented out, but you're going to have to do that. Um, and then in the main node, you're going to have to allow that container to access the network and basically tell it, like, like, because it's an unprivileged container, this is a specific node that can, you know, advertise the routes and basically act as a VPN. Uh, this is going to be the command you use when you bring it up. So tail scale up, and then <clears throat> advertise routes. Uh, this is going to be your network, so that's going to be 192.168.1.0 slash 24. Uh, that's just saying that it's going to advertise that physical subnet to the tail net, which is your collection of uh, machines that are on your tail scale. And you're going to advertise the exit node. Uh, which basically says it's going to tell it that whatever traffic is um, coming out of the machines that are on your tail net, uh, it's going to go through that exit node, which is how you get connected to, um, to your network. Uh, you install tail scale, connect to tail net, and then make sure that it's using that container as the exit node. Otherwise, it won't be doing anything. You have to actually be going through that container. Uh, set up a virtual network right here is what you got to do. Um, my computer only has one physical interface. You're going to have to set up this Linux bridge, uh, VMBR1, and then you're going to give all this stuff. Um, basically, just giving it a static. This is what you would usually see in your lab when you have like a static IP 
for a um, router, I just picked like because my web GUI is dot two five four. I made the this two five three. Um, this is for the yeah, that's the new interface. Uh, and maybe a router. <laughs> if you're on a public IP, make sure you do that. Uh, I didn't. I paid the consequences. Uh, get a PF Science ISO image. Uh, after you install, add the network uh, device with that second bridge. <coughs> so you're gonna add this one to it. That's gonna be after you install. Uh, you're gonna go through the basic PF Sense configuration of setting up the LAN and the WAN interfaces. Um, I set up DHCP server on the LAN so that any new containers, if I selected uh, this um, interface instead of this public IP one. <laughs> it would automatically get an IP through DHCP. Firewall should automatically be set up when you uh, configure PF Sense. I don't think you have to do anything with that. Um, and then also, this is important for if you have a public IP, you're going to want this is in the node of like my main node. It's it you will have this before, but after you set up this and then you connect it basically so that all the it works with that router. You're gonna to want to remove this because otherwise, if you reload the um, if you reload the interface, it's gonna get assigned an IP again, and you're gonna have the same problem. Yeah. So um, fun fact: like in that you already you can also set up NAT for the same yeah. 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 I like my nice PF Sense web GUI. Very and simple. Like, um, like, um, like very long for like four. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I'm not doing all that. I'll probably mess it up somehow. Uh, yeah, Brett. Uh, yeah, so a Linux bridge that um, it's basically a way to make a physical inter if I understand it correctly, make a physical in uh, interface basically have a, like a different logical way to um, you know it's basically like having a new logical interface assigned to that physical interface. So I only have one, but um, if I have a Linux bridge. Then I'm gonna have this. This like a virtual. It's like a virtual interface. So. Okay. Yeah. Virtual network switch. Yeah. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Thank you. <coughs> See, I'm always learning. This is the beauty of the home lab. Surround yourself with smart people. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, and here's just like a quick way to set up a Windows VM. So Proxmox Wiki has an RI guide. Uh, you need a, if you follow, it's going to tell you to follow this video that they have for this Windows 2016 server. If you follow, it's mostly the same steps. You get your Windows ISO. You also have to get the ISO for the Vert, Vertio drivers. And that's going to have all these things that you're going to have to put while you're configuring the Windows VM just because it won't work as just a virtual machine. <laughs> um, and then these are just the resource I gave it right here. You can see the I added this after you install. Um, and then after that, you can just set up some kind of remote desktop, so you don't have to use the web console because that uh, gets a lot of input lag. Um, and here's some cool things to host. Uh, Pihole, I really like this one. Uh, it's um, it uses it does ad blocking through DNS, so it has like a pre uh, pre written list by a bunch of people of uh, ad domains, and when you visit a web server, it's going to block those from showing up. Uh, I I connect to that when I use my tail scale, I can connect to it from my phone. So now if I uh, visit websites on my phone, then I, I don't have ads. So it's a cool way I can like integrate my home lab into just like, you know, mobile, like phone and stuff. Pretty cool. Uh, virtual machines, so you don't have to use RLS. RLS sucks. I spun up Windows. So I can use that for my 201, my uh, programming for inf infosec class because we need that. I uh, can play around with Docker. <coughs> this monitoring that you're about to see, both this is hosted through a container on Docker. Um, a media server you can host like Plex, so you know you can you don't have to store it on your device. You have a place you can store it immediately. Um, awesome self-hosted on GitHub is a great resource you can look at to see some ideas. For what you want to do, and here you can see my monitoring software like this. <clears throat> this is so lame. I don't know what it's saying. I don't, and I, frankly, I don't care. Um, this is the the Yasified and Girl Boss dashboard. 
with uh, so many graphics, I don't even know what half of them mean. And they're great. Uh, and then my next project is probably Fortnite Item Shop Gritty Scan. Um, I don't have the gritty, I really want it. So every 8 p.m. when the item shop refreshes, I'm gonna have a container, check if the gritty's there, and then I can go buy it. Because I'm the only one of my friends who doesn't have the gritty, and I don't like it. Uh, yeah, and here's just a video of awesome self-hosted. Just like a bunch of stuff, you know? Really cool. Uh, and next steps. Make sure you start documenting what you plan on doing with the home lab. Um, just so you have like a log of what you did and what you want to do. Uh, if you get a new device to add, create a cluster. Uh, that's basically just like a, a grouping of your physical servers. And it's like, it's going to have centralized management. It's going to be all into one firewall, so you don't have to redo the same steps. And there's going to be easy migration of your VMs and containers between the hosts. Uh, figure out a consistent way to back up your stuff. Um, just that if something fails, you always have backup. Um, and automate your updates and configurations. You don't want to go into your containers and have to do the same updates all the time. Uh, you might forget, and this just makes it so your stuff is always up to date and secure. Uh, questions? <coughs> yes. Okay, that, yeah, that's that's a great question. So, <laughs> I set up my home lab is basically on a separate network, I guess. Yeah, logically than any other device on my on my network. I guess like where I live, it's everyone shares the same number, but I guess it's my network. Um, I have everything is um, within my private network that is behind a firewall. So um, I'm not sure what you'd be doing that could like kind of escape there and cause some issues. But um, I think a, a good idea if like you want to like test some stuff out is you have like that stuff on the private network and it's not going to be touching anything else. Uh, you can even maybe disconnect it from, uh, you know, the the network, so you don't have anything going if you're trying something like that. Uh, yeah, can you? Yeah, um, in the same manner, if you disconnect your uh, VM and the VMware, just disconnect the VMware, you do it for the, the box of other only your box mock for the other cluster. Yeah. Um, in the past, I've done that because Windows Defender is scary mm -hmm. and it likes to submit your samples. And when you're talking about Defender, you don't know what to do with your samples. Yeah, so like, like, you, like you can just not assign an interface and it won't be in the network. Yeah. Typically, you're hosting intentionally or accidentally vulnerable virtual machines on the home lab. The answer is yes. Just because it's on a separate network, it doesn't mean you can't get to your home network. It has to connect to the internet somewhere. So there are definitely ways you can get to it. Like network isolation does not go through you. That's why we have this as firewalls. And mm -hmm. remember that firewalls work both ways. They don't just work on the interior network, they also work both out. So you can explicitly exclude so that anything in your home lab cannot reach out to your home network. Um, it can only go straight out to the internet. So firewalls work both ways. You can use the same thing. If someone can get in, Sometimes they can always get out. So we usually kind of think both, I guess, outside and inside the box. Um, but in terms of like the box, right? Just isolating our own network is not always like the end all be all solution. Um, yeah, that's why we say NAT is not a security product. There is not a security um, control. NAT does not control, it does not control their own So the answer is one. Um, in full play. So you have to think about uh, insider threats just as much as that. Yeah, Derek? Yeah, so you said like the Jose method of getting your OS onto your machine uh, on by accomplish machine because it had like a password on it. Did you notice that it will jump your control and get the password off the motherboard? I did not know that. <laughs> I think I did one of us, but for some reason it didn't work. It might be a theory because I was just too judgy. Uh, yeah, so um, Derek just asked uh, if you can just like kind of take out the jumper or whatever. I'm not sure what it is, but password jumper, password jumper yeah. But uh, for some people, it didn't work. So 
Um, uh, if if that worked for me, I would not have used the Jose method, but uh, I, I I did have to use the Jose method. It, it's a it's a very solid method. Um, any other questions? Yeah, Chase. Yeah. Uh, so my I don't. So that's <laughs> so this 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 next steps is um this is kind of for me. So uh, I also have to be doing this stuff that I have in my next steps. Um, I've been really busy, so I haven't been able to give much love to my home lab. But I want to. I have a lot of things that I want to do. Uh, I just have to find the time to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I am. I am. Yeah, I, I host, like, even, like, the Windows VM, like, all my other containers. It's still on that one, the competition machine. And uh, I, it, so it's not the best resources, but it, it like, it works. Like, it, it, it does everything it needs to do. Um, and I got I got the second one. I just haven't uh, set up another node and added it to the cluster yet. So but, a, a lot of yeah, the containers are very the containers are very lightweight. So um, yeah, containers are great. I use them for a lot of things. They're very quick to set up. Very easy to test stuff out. Uh, VM's a little bit more, but that's how it is. No else? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so here yeah, if I just I'll just show you the the what I had before. Yeah, so right here. Uh, so I have for my databases class I set up an SQL server so I don't have to run the locally on my machine if that takes up memory. I don't want to do that. So I tell SQL to connect to it um, to do work on there. I have this VS Code server if I needed to like you know program with the Linux environment in sysadmin. I would connect to the, that remote host and I can put them in there. Um, uh, PyHolio, that's my PyHole that uh, blocks all the ads. Docker is what hosts uh, InfluxDB and also Grafana for that combined form, that monitoring thing I showed you before. Uh, this is TailScale, uh, that's what I use for remote access. PFSense, that's the router. Um, and then Windows, I use that. It's, it's just like a Windows computer in my home lab. I can connect to it. And it's like I just have another computer on my Mac, except it's not being hosted on my Mac. Yeah, Joe. Have you experimented with you guys on Netflix at all? Did you use the new VLAN or the new Netflix in Gen Hotspot? Uh, I have not. I, I, I not. I've only done stuff with like setting up that Linux bridge. Um, I didn't know that they had a new feature. Um, and VLANs, I mean, it's still in yeah. beta, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I will like look into that. I want to look into all this stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but once I find the time to do it, um, it's it's really interesting just like playing around and like learning stuff as you go. Yeah. I actually okay. <laughs> I forgot about that. But yeah, so um, in ops we were talking about uh, Ansible and I. Uh, we kind of Skyles showed us a demo of Ansible with um, with your containers. So what I'm really trying to do is use Ansible to kind of automate. And this is an idea, this is what Skyles talked about. So this is his idea. Um, well, maybe not his idea, but he told me about it. Um, you use it to when you all you have to do is create a container, and then you can automate your configuration with it, like. Um, Disabling SSH root login, login. Um, you can you know download some stuff that you know you need like maybe IP utils, um, Docker if you want to like you know be flexible with what you host on there. Um, what else? Um, like yeah, um, disabling root login and adding a user, uh, stuff like that. And so you can use Ansible to. Um, to basically automate that, uh, I also want to do that to automate my updates and configure and automate the updates so I don't have to do it uh, manually for each machine. Terraform, I, I looked into it a little bit. 
Um, it's it's I, I really want to do it with Proxmox. Only problem is I don't know what I I, I guess it would be a good way to test it actually. That that's that is a that is a good that is actually a good point and uh, I have a new idea that oh probably <laughs> my next, my next improvement to the home lab is Terraform for backups that's actually a great idea thank you so much Brad um, and then pipeline it yeah yeah so that's that's like great great ideas coming all, all over the place thank you so much guys um what uh what were you say. But yeah, I, I I thought about like you know even if it's not just for backups, if I want to just practice with bringing up either one container at a time, just so I can get like used to the Terraform environment. Uh, I know that's definitely something I wanted to play around with. All right, um, and that's it.